now I get to test my mic and see how it's working. Can everyone hear me all right? I can't see any of you on account of the spotlight. So I'm looking into the light and I hope this is not the end. <laughs> okay, that's, that's not the only joke I'll have for tonight, but it's the best that I might have. At any rate, thank you for coming out. Uh, Today, we're, we're going to give a shot at, at trying to understand, or at least display. I mean, when I, when I look at back at my title, I think, well, Craig, that's rather bold. Understanding. You know, that's a bit deep. Uh, how about scratching the surface of the complexities of imaging the Earth, right? It's a, it's a tough place that we live in, and the ask is always increasing. So at the university, we're consistently trying to be out on the forefront, and the parts that make people nervous, and the, and the pieces of, of areas where we don't know what's next. So that's the nature of research for... For me and for, I know for the rest of my colleagues at the university, we try very hard uh, to keep outreaching, going you know, further past the end uh, and trusting that the next step is in fact a uh, nice sure footing and not quicksand. At any rate, so we're going to start here tonight with just a brief history uh, of remote sensing. It's going to be ever so brief. I'm not going to try to give you my first, uh, first year lecture on this kind of material, but remote sensing is... Uh, it's kind of a quixotic adventure where you have to be able to tell things without touching them. So I always think back to being a child and having my, my mom and we're walking through a store and she says, you know, don't touch anything. So all you can do is look at stuff and you have to infer all kinds of bits of information just by looking at things. So that's tough. So we're going to gather this data from a distance and the further away from it we get, we hope that we can you know, get reliable information, but it's difficult, right? Uh, so you're doing it right now, I hope. Again, I can't see you, but I'm going to trust that you're doing this. Sight is the biological analog of remote sensing, so if you're looking at something and you're gathering information just by the looking, then you're doing what we're seeking to do from space. Okay, that's, that's the idea. Uh, we're going to make use of the electromagnetic spectrum for us, so magnetic, electromagnetic radiation is what we're using, and how it interacts with the surface. Now, it interacts with the surface in a wide variety of ways, most of them more complicated than we're willing to admit in public. So we're going to address some of those tonight. Uh, so how, how much information can we actually gather about an object by simply looking at it. That's one of the fundamental questions for us academically. So here we go. Now, could you tell the difference between a cruller and a sour cream glazed just by looking at it? So without using the sign. So if we didn't have the sign, if I just put those two arrows up and I said, can you tell the difference between those two donuts? That is the fundamental crux of the matter for remote sensing, right? Is can we tell the difference between the two donuts without being able to actually see the sign, right? Because we're not, and we're not allowed to touch them we're not allowed to do anything other than look through the glass at the Tim Hortons on campus. That's where I took that photo. Uh, okay, so it depends on a few fundamentals. The first one is how big is the object, so, right? So can you see it, right? So that's the first one. Next, how different is it compared to other things, right? So donuts are donuts, grass is green, but trees are green too, right? So that, that creates a little bit of a problem. So it's hard to tell the difference between things that fundamentally look the same. Right? Does it change over time in a special way? That's another really good question. So for example, deciduous trees versus coniferous trees, uh, could we tell the difference between those? Well, you know, if we do it at different times of the year, yeah, maybe, we might have a shot. Uh, and then in general, the more you see, the more you know. That's what we understand. So the closer you get, the higher resolution, rapid eye, things like that, and you zoom in a little bit, maybe we'll understand them a little bit more. Okay, so this is where we started. So from humble beginnings, uh, from entertainment to modern science, this is where we started. I like to think of the, uh, the picture that's of the guy in the picnic basket over here as being the first selfie, all right? So back just after the advent of photography, people decided to hop into uh, air balloons, right? So hot air balloons and ride around in wicker baskets and take pictures of their surroundings because it was the first time we actually had the opportunity of doing that. This uh, image on, I guess that's the right-hand side of the screen, comes to us from Boston in 1860. And that was the first uh, aerial image taken over North America. Right? So that 1860, that's a long time ago. Now that's a, a long time before we'd achieved flight, a long time before we'd achieved all sorts of other things. And why did we do this? Because we enjoy looking at where we live. That's it, that was the only reason. Okay, then we go from that, and we're gonna skip forward just a little bit, and we're gonna get ourselves to World War I. Uh, when people are shooting at you, the game tends to get a little bit more serious. Understanding where your enemy is is always important. And if you have a look over here, buddy on the left, uh, that's a bit of a dangerous way to capture an image out of a plane, so he's dangling out the side of it. Uh, buddy on the right maybe is doing a bit better job, but he's also just sitting there trying to capture an image of where the enemy might be. Uh, in World War II, we invent a few new technologies, and then the Cold War hits, and we figure spying on people is a really good idea. 
Right? So we decide, first of all, we should go really high. So here's a U-2 spy plane. This is the reincarnation of that particular plane. It's the same one that we had in the 50s. Uh, this is the one that NASA operates, and all the ports here, those are just for cameras. Right? We never shot a single bullet out of any of these things. We just go really high. But the Russians shot one of those down, so that wasn't such a good idea. So maybe we should go faster than a speeding bullet, right? So you can't shoot us down if we have uh, one of these. So if you're in an SR-71 Blackbird, you're zipping right along, and this never had a gun on it either, it just had cameras too. So we were just interested in what they were up to. That's okay. Uh, the SR-71 Blackbird turns out to be not such a great idea either, it's very fast, it's very expensive. Uh, space might be cheaper, could be more fun, could get more images out of it. So this is the first time we went to space to image, this is the Corona mission, and that is the satellite, right there, that little guy. Now we're still doing small sats today, so they're not really, uh, they're not really new. They're just a revisit of where we once were. Uh, they were crazy though, because we didn't have digital technologies. These were film cameras that were sent off into space. Right? So this is how we did it. Right? We, here we have, I mean, this is uh, right from the mission itself. So here we have the tanks on the ground, right? The Russians probably are building tanks, probably very scary. So here we have our tanks on the ground, and it would feed the film up to the nose cone, and it would jettison that cone out with the film in it, and then we needed to take it off to get it processed. But first, we had to catch it, okay? So this is ridiculous. It's 19, 1959 to 1972, this is what we were doing. This was classified until 1992. This was top secret. If you knew about this up until 1992, you would be taken to a little room somewhere and questioned. In 1995, Bill Clinton decided maybe we could decommission some of this. And it wasn't until 2002 that this imagery became part of the public domain. Just think about that. 2002, we released this stuff. 1959 to 1972. All right, so the plane here, the Hercules comes by and it picks this thing off. And if it misses it, you know, it might have to loop around a few times. And you just hope, fingers crossed, that you can catch that canister. And you really hope it didn't jettison over it somewhere where the Russians might get it first. So this is not a great technological solution. Fast forward, right, we're going to move up. So these are the space pioneers. These are the people that we look to uh, to get this stuff done. So we've been doing aerial surveys post-World War. Right, so we're able to do that. So we have images from Lethbridge that span back to 1919, just post-World War I. So we have aerial surveys. They're great. They work really well. Uh, but they don't cover much area. So that means you're not going to map the world using this technology very rapidly. Right, so space is expensive and mostly military at the time. Right? And then the U.S. Geological Survey recognizes the value of Earth observation. So they say, you know, this is really what we need to do. And this is the quote. Right? So the time is, is now right and urgent to apply space technology towards the solution of many uh, pressing natural resource problems being compounded by population and industrial growth. Anyone want to guess at the date? When do you think that, might, that quote might come from? 2005. 2005 or 1966. <laughs> All right, so that is when that came from. That's uh, Stuart Udall. He was the director of the USGS announcing the Earth Resources Observation this Satellite. That's what we called Landsat before. We called it Landsat. That's September 21st, 1966. Uh, so there's, that's a long time ago. So we still face these problems today because we haven't fixed it. So we went from the corona thing, which was largely a military spy thing, very dangerous, very covert, uh, into sending up satellites into space that were not meant for military purposes, but were meant to image the Earth for peaceful means. Right, to try to gather information about how we, as a species, were impacting our Earth. And we sent them into polar orbits because we live in the northern hemisphere and that's where all the land mass is, so that's efficient for us. So up they go and anyways, we zip them around, we put them into orbit. The average time per revisit to get back to the single spot on Earth for these satellites is between 20 and 25 days, that's normal. Uh, and then to cover a continent is going to take many thousands of images uh, compo composited into mosaics over time in order to get that kind of mapping done. Therein lies a few problems. So imaging Earth, the early days. Uh, this is kind of new for us, but at this point in time, over a million images are being downloaded each year from the U.S. Geological Survey Landsat program alone. Right? That's current data. That's amazing, it's amazing. This has a tremendous archive and it's now being used. This begins in about 2005. Most people now understand Google Earth. Uh, when I first came to the University of Lethbridge in 2002 and people asked me what I did, I said I make maps, which is a lie, but at least it helped. 
And then they invented Google Earth, and then when people ask me now, I say I do Google Earth, which is a lie, but at least there's a reference point for them. And they say, oh, great, oh, I understand, that's really cool, this is neat stuff, and I'm like, oh, my word, anyways, we'll get, we'll get by. At any rate, there also were a number of changes at the U.S. GS, one of them was Google actually starting to download the entire archive and that slowed them down to the pace that they couldn't handle and then they called Google and they said, what are you doing? And they said, we're downloading your entire archive and they went, you're nuts. And they went, what do you need? More computers or stuff? Money? Is that the problem? We'll be right over. Okay. <laughs> and then they wanted to fix that up. So they've, they've got this done now. There is currently more images collected each day than we can process or view. I mean, we have that kind of technical capability now as a species. That's amazing. And then here's the first pretty picture I thought I would show. So this is just part of the archive. Uh, by the way, this is the Yukon River Delta. So I just think, you know, Earth is a beautiful place. You should see some of it. Anyway, so what do we currently measure? Now, measuring things applies something a little different, right? It applies that we know something and that the data that we get are therefore calibrated and the subject of tonight's talk. Okay, so first of all, we understand the atmospheric components. We've been doing this part for a long time. So wind speed, direction, CO2, ozone, radiation, budgets, water vapor, that's fairly well characterized and well understood. We struggle a little bit with the ocean. Ocean color is a big deal. Relates to climate change and other things. Wave height, sea surface temperature, sea level, sea level, sea level rise, that kind of thing. We should do that. Terrestrial issues are always of interest to us as a species. So biomass, land cover, Glaciers, ice cap, fire, biophysical plant parameters, soil moisture, snow cover. These are things we routinely measure, right, on a, well, some of them on a daily basis. So that's sort of fun. So where do I hit, to hit the bricks here with the calibration piece? Okay, so this is the calibration story. And I'd love to tell you that I entered into the calibration world just nice and neatly and, and everything was fine. But as with everything in my life, I, I get there backwards, mostly. Uh, as my wife will tell you, right? I mean, if there's a front door, I'll never use it. Uh, but think of the things in your day-to-day -day life that rely on some form of calibration. Okay, so this is just the first one. I, I was thinking about this in my office, and I thought, well, who wouldn't recognize the National Research Council time signal? It comes to us at 11 o'clock every day, right? The beginning of the long dash, following 10 seconds of silence. We all have heard that a million times, and we know that's when you set your watch. That's 11 o'clock. We know that's calibrated. We understand that. That's good. You go to the grocery store, you like to buy some apples or oranges or something and they put them on the scale and you make sure there's nothing else that's going to be on the scale because you'll end up paying for something twice. That's really great. So the scale at the grocery store, we calibrate those things. Fuel pumps, right? Even at $39 a barrel, was that what oil was this morning? Like why are we out here tonight not going back to living in our caves? Um, but it's so cheap, it's unbelievable. But we correct that volume to 15 degrees Celsius. So it's not the volume of whatever the fuel might be at that day, it's corrected volume to 15 degrees C. We've calibrated, there's a little sticker on the pumps that say somebody from the government had come out and checked that and calibrated that pump and made sure it's okay. Now we're gonna tell you all sorts of stories about space and you're gonna find out we really need to calibrate some of that data so that it's corrected <laughs> and it might be, might be there. So when do we need to do this? Well, if a device is new, we should do it. Usually that would make sense, calibrate something that's new. Major repair modification, if something's been fixed or changed, you should check it. It's a good idea. After a certain amount of time, right, so the pumps, they're only good for a certain amount of time, then we should go back and have a look. That's a good idea. After a specific amount of use, right, it's a good idea. Use it lots, check it, right? If you shock it, drop it, vibrates, impact, that comes up later, we'll talk about that, and you should check it. Right? When, when readings seem questionable, when you get a, a bit of data back and you're like, well, I don't think I really had 12 pounds worth of apples there in my little bag. I, I think that could be a wrong number. We should check that. Right? It's all about being consistent. That's what calibration is about. Now, it's not about being exciting. In fact, I'm almost shocked that there's this many people out here tonight. Normally, if I'm presenting this at like a professional organization meeting of scientists, there's about four of them in the room <laughs> at this point. And it's like, okay, but, and they're all my friends and we know each other and it, we could have just exchanged email. We didn't have to get on a flight. Um, and that's often what happens. Okay, so satellite calibration is a little bit different. The instruments that we have on board satellites are very accurate at doing their job. I mean, in the industry, sometimes they refer to these things as pictures and that's like fingernails on a chalkboard for me. These are scientific grade instruments that we have floating around in space. They're extremely expensive, multiple millions of dollars. Dr. Ryan, he'll tell you all about it that go into actually putting these things together. It's not, it's not a cheap camera from the corner store. All right, so you need to be able to get from the digital value that the satellite is going to give you to an energy value, a real number, an energy value that's consistent on Earth, just like 
the National Research Council time signal or a fuel pump, right? That's what we're trying to get to. Now, how do we do this? Well, for the most part, we do it in a lab. So we sit down with the, the instrument prior to its launch, and we usually shine it at a very bright light, not unlike I'm getting right now. And then you say, well, what does that bright light look like? And then you figure that out. Uh, and there also would be design specifications. So somebody would have said, well, I'm not going to accept that unless you can actually get me a reading of that bright light in certain areas at certain amounts. Oh, OK, that's, that's fine. Then you're going to launch this thing. So I was thinking, OK, how do I explain this to people? Take your best camera, right? The, the, the thing you've spent, maybe a Nikon camera, something nice. Throw it on the floor, you know, hard. You know, that's kind of like launching a camera. You're going to put it on a rocket and send it into space. Take it, throw it on the floor. It gets worse. Then I thought, well, geez, it's going to space. So put it in your freezer now, right? But it's got to not just be the freezer. It's got to be very cold, near absolute zero. And that changes lots of properties. Like things, weird things happen at absolute zero. Oh, and then it's got to be in a vacuum. <laughs> All right, so arrange for this. See how well that camera works. All right, so what happens, what we understand with a lot of the satellite stuff that we do is that those lab calibrations, once we put these things into space, they're done. <laughs> they're out the window. They don't hold anymore, right? Because you just finished doing something rather dastardly to that instrument. That means it doesn't, it, it works amazingly. It works. So on board these satellites, especially back in the olden days, we used to have lamps. We had little lights in there that you'd turn on and you'd send the sensor over to look at the light. Uh, some people flip the satellites around to look at the moon. Every once in a while, you know, full moon, hey, go look at the moon, that's consistent. Uh, and then you, you try like the Dickens to get this thing to give you the right data, the same data all the time. But back in the early days, this was considered mostly a technical thing. Uh, it's extremely hard to look it up. Like, I send my students out every once in a while and they say, well, Craig, how do we do this? And I say, well, go look it up. And it's a quixotic adventure that I send them on because I merely want them to become frustrated, right? I, you know, go to the library, look it up. And then they go to the library and they come back and they go, I can't find anything. And I'm like, yes, so now we can start, right? Because you can't find anything on this. It's just not there. If you're not in the in-group, it's really hard to figure this out. And the in-group know how to figure it out and they don't share it very often. All right, so this is all part of the story. So the first generation, we had some sort of plug and play calibration solutions. And quite honestly, we were working on other aspects of the science. These were the early days. We weren't worried. We had some simple things that we did. We thought that was okay. That was fine. We were making maps. That was fine. No one wanted us to... Mapping and measuring are two different things. Now we're after a measurement, right? So that gets hard. We didn't have very many satellite systems, right? And the data were reasonably difficult to get. Whether it came to you on exabyte tape, and I know there's some people here who still know what that is. Uh, hard drives, right? We used to send hard drives. You put data on hard drives and send it in the mail. And, you know, these are days the internet couldn't move that kind of information around. It was hard, right? So we didn't have a lot of that floating around. You know, entire careers in my world were spent looking at one or two images. Now it's, you could look at thousands in a day, right? So we have a changing landscape of imaging, essentially, uh, from the space sector and from other means, where we have lots of systems, tons of systems, hundreds of satellites zipping around. It's soon going to become, that's the reality, endless amounts of data that we can't really handle and increasing problems, right? Because people have higher demands in terms of what they're expecting us to deliver. So here's what we know. Right, we have a good idea what the sun looks like. My goodness, right? We've been doing that for a while, so we're, we're fine. It looks a lot like the light. Okay. And then we have a reasonable idea what the atmosphere looks like. Reasonable, not complete. And the atmosphere is forever changing, and it's usually messing things up, and it bothers everybody. I don't know a single remote sensing person that doesn't want to remove the atmosphere from Earth just for a minute. Okay. It won't be a comfortable place to live for that minute, but that's okay. It's only a minute. Hold your breath. Then we're going to image the whole thing, and then we're going to put that atmosphere back, and then everyone's going to be okay. And then we're going to know what stuff looks like finally, because we're going to remove all the bugs off the windscreen, which is the way people who do atmospheric correction characterize atmospheric correction. All images have to be taken through the atmosphere. That's unfortunate, but true. Okay, so we can tell then, by looking through image archives, what areas will look like over time. We should be able to do this. But they're not calibrated very accurately, the archives, and things into the future. Uh, and then some of the smaller sats and some of the other latest satellite uh, evolutions are not including things like lamps and other methods of doing the calibration. So we need a better solution. Right? So the data are good, the methods are crude. Sorry, that's the way we are. So we need, we need a calibration. So this is the need, right? So we have a reasonable idea 
this is if we have the following information, we'll be able to get a calibration to work. The first is, what does the surface look like? And so if we have a surface, what does it look like? I'm going to show you a few of those in a sec. Then, if we can get that, it would be really handy if the surface were flat. So if it was Saskatchewan or something, that would be awesome. Just nice and flat would be good. Most surfaces aren't flat, so that's going to mess the first bit up, but that's okay. Now, if we've modeled, of course, what the surface should look like, which we do a lot because we haven't seen a lot of these things, then we should check our models. That would be nice. We should do that too. Uh, and of course, the better the surface measurements are, the better your calibration would be and the better your images will be. So that would be nice too. Get that all done. So better data is always far more useful than those data which we don't really have a complete calibration for. So here's my favorite picture. This one comes to us from the Canada Center for Remote Sensing. Uh, and this is how they used to describe this fundamental qual uh, quantity that we all seek to, to evaluate, which is this thing called reflectance. So for people in remote sensing, reflectance is, uh, is sort of our fundamental. It's our touchstone for, ter for terrestrial remote sensing anyways. And it's just a simple ratio that takes a look at how much energy we get out of the sun. And I love the cartoon aspect of this, you know, because, it, because that's where it works. It works in cartoon land. Uh, so if we have the sun coming in, and then we measure how much is coming out, then we have a ratio of what's coming in to what's coming out, and then everybody in our little spot satellite over here, everyone's unhappy, right? It's like, oh, that's the way it works. And we have bare soil, and we have grass, we have water and forests, and these are all great, and they have like fancy little houses with little roofs and things, and that's great. And then we have this, and this is the problem, right? So this is one of our first problems, is that this is a complex world. Here we have just a baseball diamond, so we just have grass. Right? It's one of my favorite images for this. I use it all the time in class because it shows the fundamental issue, which is not only do we have energy coming in and we have that energy coming back to us and we're measuring it, but reflectance actually turns out to be a complex function of both the physical state of the target, physical and chemical state of the target, as well as the target's architecture, and we can't forget that, especially as we start zooming in on Earth. The architecture of the target matters more and more. So if we look at this, we all understand that that grass on the baseball diamond has just been rolled, and that's what gives it different, a different tone, is that we're looking at one side of the blade of grass versus the other. We understand that it's all grass, but if we image it, and then we ask for information, that's two different things, right? It's grass rolled in one direction, grass rolled in another direction, right? It might look a little different depending on how you look at it. That's unfortunate and complex. It's hard. Okay. Uh-oh, now the image can't be displayed. All right. I'm like, is that, was that an important image? I hope not. At any rate, so pseudo-invariant calibration sites. This is, I'm trying to remember exactly what my presentation just missed. Um, at any rate, so we're at the grass stage. Now, what we need to be able to do, so we've got sensors that are up in space. We've got other bits and pieces that are there. Uh, we've got calibrations that we don't understand, and we have a really complex surface. That's the story. All right, so if you're still with me, that's great. That was the other slide would have summed up. All right, so back on. There we go. So pseudo-invariant calibration sites. This is how we do this. We look for surfaces on Earth that don't change regardless of when we image them. They should be pseudo-invariant. They can't be invariant, but we say, well, close enough to invariant. Pseudo-invariant works close enough. Now, if they happen to be temporally stable, so if we note that they don't change over time, then you can correct the following things. If you just look at them. So you get imaging system drift over time. So imaging systems change. We send them into space, the various bits and pieces, when you put them into that vacuum and into the freezer and all, if you, you smashed them around a bit, they change over time. So we could then measure that. That would be fine. Uh, differences between imaging systems. So Rapid Eye, if you use that as my example tonight, they have five satellites in their constellation. How is it that they're going to be able to ensure that images of each one of those five satellites are exactly the same all the time? They have to calibrate. If they don't calibrate, then you'll be able to tell it came from one, two, three, four, and five. They don't want that. They just want those all to look the same. So differences between imaging systems, you have to get rid of that. Right? And then if you happen to have uh, a ground reference, a really good one, you can correct to a physical unit right, with high precision. This happens to be the holy grail of Earth observation imaging. Right? That's what we really, really want, is to be able to do this once and for all. Now, this is how I enter the picture, right? So I know this stuff, right? That's from a long time ago. And I'm studying other things, and I have a problem, right? I have a problem when I look at things that I don't always understand what it is that I look at. 
And you get confused by it, so then you think, well, I should really build some instrumentation that takes care of this. And I build monsters. That's what I do. I hang out in my lab, and I put robots together and things. And I work in a geography department. They accept this activity. They don't mind me too much. I basically keep quiet, and then I think, well, this is interesting. But I'm not thinking about this. I happen to be at a conference, and I'm talking to a friend of mine who works at, uh, he works at Arizona, University of Ari the other U of A, I call it, right? The University of Arizona, College of Optical Sciences. Um, and this, then years later, I get a phone call, and he says, Craig, we need you. And I said, that's unlikely, you know? <laughs> and he says, no, I'm being serious. And I'm like, you're really being serious? What do you need me for? And he says, well, we have this little problem. We want to do some calibration, and they're part of this big calibration consortium in the States that does this stuff. And he goes, we really, really, really desperately need to get a look from every angle at this surface that we're looking at. And he's like, and you've got the baddest instrument in town. Yours is, it's fast, it's accurate. And I'm like, yeah, okay, I mean, I can maybe do that. Um, so then he said, well, and NASA's involved. And I said, well, that's gonna look good on the CD, right? That's gonna make my dean happy, so I'm in. <laughs> and we're gonna do whatever it is that we need to do to get that done. All right, so this is what we need to do. The first thing is we have to find a reasonable site, so let's have a look. We only have 10 of these on Earth. Well, ta-da. <laughs> I, there are 10 global pseudo invariant uh, sites that we use for characterizing Earth observation satellites. I like to say whenever I talk about these things that it's the only, one of the only places on Earth where all humanity get together and decide that the betterment of humans is more worthwhile than worrying about little political outcomes and other things that are, that are sort of there. So note where they are. The geographer in me always looks at this and goes, oh, that's interesting. There's a whole schwack of them right there in, in Saharan Africa. Well, that should be good. We have one in the Sonoran Desert. So that's kind of like North America, but I'll tell you a bit about that in a minute. We've got one in China. That's fine. You can go to the middle of Australia if you have nothing better to do with your time. It's a, long, it's a big continent, right? I mean, the projection messes this up, but it's a long way from anywhere. Or, I mean, you can head down to South America, maybe. But the bulk of them are there in Africa. Now, if we, these are only ones that have been identified just by images, right? The vast majority of these we haven't even seen. Uh, physically, which is fun. So I'm going to take you to Libya. So Libya 4 happens to be one of the best targets that we have on Earth for doing this. Many satellite systems use Libya 4. Uh, it's the sort of what's one of the preferred ones. At any rate, so it's located in the desert. You know, okay, that's fine. It's bright. Yeah, we know that. That's great. We could figure that out without even going there. Uh, it doesn't change much over time. So Libya 4 is around the best that we could do. It's around 2%. So 2% variability is all we really see at Libya 4. So it's a very stable target in a very unstable country. <laughs> so if they said, Craig, pack up all of your gear and come to Libya, I'd say, I think I'm busy that week. Uh, sorry, got other things to do. Uh, at any rate, so we don't want Libya. Libya is not good. In fact, that Sonoran Desert target, which is just south of where I'm going to take you on our little field trip here in a minute, uh, that's in Mexico, which is a lovely place for people from Lethbridge to go. You know, usually around spring break, we all go to Mexico and we stay in some little place down there, and that's great. Don't cross the border into Mexico with half a million dollars worth of equipment in the back of a U-Haul van. That's not advised by the risk and safety people at the university, okay? Uh, it's a very different kind of adventure if you go to Mexico the way I would. Okay, so we need to measure a couple of things. The first one uh, is the effect of sun angle. So if this, t if this target is stable, then we get the idea that the satellites, as they're coming over top in their orbit, are always at about the same time of the day, right? But the sun, darn it's hide, right, is, it's in the same spot. We just move. I guess it's our fault, right? So we just wobble around a little bit, and that's going to create some angular differences in terms of how much energy is going to hit the surface of the Earth. We get that. We live in Lethbridge. We have seasons. It's a problem. Now, if we then do that, we can measure a couple things. First, if you measure the surface at various angles over a single day, you could simulate what the surface would look like. Again, it's an invariant surface, right? It, uh, for all the year, you could, you could pull this off. I'm going to show you how we did this. This is fun. So the see, solar angle effects and variability per solar angle are extremely important because they're going to tell us how this variability manifests itself. And if we understand how it manifests itself, we can correct it. If we can correct it, we can get the images to look right all the time. This is awesome. This is Libya 4. I'm just going to flash this up fast because I don't want to run out of time tonight. But we can see that it goes up and down, and it doesn't vary a whole lot over time. This is in a single band, but you can see how much effort has been put into this particular target. These are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of images over a long period of time, and then how many physical measurements do we have of that surface on the ground? None. <laughs> Libya, okay? Uh, we don't have any. So that's not good. 
So how many of these do we have that we actually measure what I measure, which is called the bidirectional reflectance distribution function, and I didn't really want to mention that, or goniometers tonight, but the dean already tipped my hat. Uh, at any rate, so we go out and we measure this stuff, and you're going to have to learn a little bit about how to read one of these things. It's pretty straightforward. Wherever you see the little star, that's where the sun is. Okay, and this is just every possible angle that you could look at from a hemisphere plotted for that specific target. And this is the take home. It's brighter where the sun is. Okay. It's darker where the sun isn't. I yeah, got it. All right, so if you got that much, then you're already well ahead of the game. All right, number three. Let's move it on. Okay, so let's have a shot at finding a particular needle in a haystack. So what we're trying to do here is instead of getting a relative target, we want an absolute target because we can hit this with more data gathering equipment uh, than anyone's ever seen. So let's give it a shot and off we go. So let's see some results. Craig, for heaven's sake, stop talking and show them some pictures. <laughs> Uh, all right, so here we go. Uh, Salton Sea, okay, Mexico, and our desert right there. Okay, so this is the middle of nowhere, right? Literally, it's in California, but it's not the fun part of California. So when I told my wife, I said, hey, uh, honey, I'm going to go to California in March. She was like, you taking me? And I'm like, I'm going somewhere you don't want to go. Anyway, we can also look at it at other wavelengths just to give you some pretty pictures because it looks nice, like it's kind of fun. We can do that, that's great. Okay, seriously, we should be looking at this. So we're gonna focus in now just on the little desert patch that's there. And we're gonna have a look at, at, is this thing even possible? So we'll have a look at the latest bit of Landsat data. Landsat is a, it's still a research satellite, so it's really well characterized. We know what it's doing. This is uh, September 23rd and September 26th, one year apart, uh, two images. Let's just have a quick look. So this is the desert. The site that we're going to look at is actually right in here, just this path. We don't look at this stuff over here. It's going to change quite a bit. This stuff here, though, it doesn't change much. Okay, and there it is. So that's 14, 15. This is three days apart, so you can't really account for the fact that that could be a solar angle change. There's something going on year to year. It's not too bad, though. Okay, that's interesting. All right, now let's just change it up. Let's just stick with me for a minute. Uh, September 22nd and September 15th, so that's a long way apart. This is the same sensor, a different year. We're just going to run that up, so we'll just try a different sensor for a change here. So this is L5. Now, Landsat 5 has been operating for so long that it's older than lots of people in the room. Um, okay, so Landsat 5 is not so great, but it, it could use some help, right? That, that's different. I didn't mess with these images, by the way. Everyone always goes, oh, remote sensing people, they just mess with the image. I didn't. I just put these up, and they're all processed the same way. Different sensor, different year. Okay, so we'll try this out. This out for size. That's TM5 again, right? And that's Landsat 8. We'd like it if those two looked the same. That would be nice. This is desert. This isn't supposed to change much. Right? That's not the same. Okay, that's not helpful, but it's not too bad. Then let's take a look at uh, the two different periods of the time where we would have both the solar max, so the max solar angle for the overflight, as well as around the solar minimum, right? So Christmas time. Right, so there we go, June. So the site looks now, there's some weird stuff. This has already been atmospherically corrected, so we we're supposed to have removed the atmosphere. Didn't work, though. You can see the atmosphere there. You know, ah, oh, wow. Um, look what happens in December. So when that sun angle is really low, that surface looks quite different. OK, so this is just, I didn't mess with anything here. Just pull the images. So let's go. <laughs> let's go and have a look. This sounds like fun. So we literally load up a U-Haul van. We cross the border. We got more equipment in this van than I never thought I'd make it across the border. I pull up to the border, the guy at the border says, what are you doing? And I said, I'm going to California to measure sand. And he said, well, that's so crazy, that must be true. <laughs> and, my, and my wife can verify that every time I cross the border, I get so nervous that I usually end up in a little room explaining myself, right? Uh, and we just drove across, it was unbelievable. So on we go, 26 hours later, we end up here at the site, Brawley, California. This is what it looks like when you get there. It does look like you've arrived. Uh, on a film set because they have filmed a large number of films there. And we set up a bunch of equipment and we notice, well, we notice a few things. There's a little bit of vegetation out there. That could be an issue. The sand is lovely. It's mostly there and there's a lot of tire tracks is what we notice. <laughs> Turns out this is a big recreational area for people that love to go drive around on the sand. Now the fun part, NASA shows up. So they show up with their plane. These guys are great because they don't like doing the groundwork. They just say, Craig, go do the groundwork. And I say, okay but fly over me. So they flew over, we've got lots of, we have a full high resolution elevation model. They also flew hyperspectral data, multiple angles all over top of us, lots and lots of data. This is as much data as ever been collected. So we can simulate everything, every 
angle, every tilt of the surface of the earth, we can get all of this done. Or at least they better, because I don't have time to do it. In the meantime, we have these crazy locals zipping around in very high-powered sand rails, trying to kill us as we're out there being nerdy scientists trying to get some measurements made. In fact, this is our site, right? So here's my graduate, my graduate student uh, having a cup of coffee, right? The, the guys from South Dakota doing some measurements, and this is the robot thing. Okay, so all it does is it zips around in a big circle. It's a four-meter circle, two-meter arc, and it sends a sensor up and down and measures really detailed observations of the same spot on the surface. The hard part is, when there's that many sand rails out there, finding a spot on the surface they haven't touched. That was it, folks. In the front part of the dunes, there was this little patch, this big, and it was just big enough, and that's all we needed. All right, so out there we go, and we're going to measure this. Now, I never tell my grad students these things before we go, but I didn't mention to him that we had to start at sun up, and we had to work until sun down on the day, and it's a desert, and it's like 38 degrees, and the surface temperature is hotter than that. And it's like, wow, that's not going to be a fun day for anybody, because we have to be out there banging away for a full 12-hour day. So we did it, right, because he didn't know. Um, so this is what we did. We collected a complete hemispherical set of reflectance values, measured as often, as often as possible from sunrise to sunset. Now, the primary advantage of the piece of equipment that I designed and built is it happens to be about 10 times faster than everybody else's on Earth. And it kind of sounds boastful, uh, but we did discover that that was true. The other group that was out measuring got uh, five measurements over the two days, and we got 57. Um, so we, like, we measured the heck out of this. So this is going to be fun. Uh, the surface doesn't really change that much over time. Uh, and the major factor throughout the year should be the sun angle at this location, if this is going to work as a, an invariant feature site for us. Uh, and again, if you're doing your satellite overflights, you're only going to get 22 times per year where you can even have a look at the site. So you better get this right. Okay, so we have to work pretty hard at this. Uh, deserts normally are a pretty safe bet as long as somebody in a sand rail isn't trying to kill you. Okay, so let's have a look at the data. Here's the solar zenith variation for that site for their overflight time. So it just has a nice little uh, bell-shaped curve. That's kind of what we expect. That's good. And then this is the day that we were there. So I didn't pick the day, but it's, we got pretty close. So the, the solar maximum of that day was about 55 degrees. And each one of these little dots is a measurement that my team was able to make of that surface. And that, folks, represents the most dense single BRF collection ever done on Earth. Uh, we did it on our first day. So 27 measurements in a single day. Each one of those is a hyperspectral bit. It's a massive amount of data. It took months to process it. In fact, we just got done. We went out in March and we just finished. The, yeah, the other day, like seriously. Okay, that's, that's the first yeah I've ever had. Okay, so this is what sand looks like. It's boring. It's not vegetation. It's not even fun. There we go. That's what, and that, we, we like that. That's what it's supposed to look like. We're just going to have a quick look here because I actually have a data set, a data point for every single dot along an entire line from 400 to 1,000 nanometers. Okay, so you don't want to do this if it's a, it's like a, it's not a stay in school program, but it would be a, would be the result if you stayed in school too long. Um, okay, so here's what it looks like. Now, all I can do is show you some of the really weird things, because I haven't figured it out yet. As I finished this last week, and I was like, wow, I really have to finish this before my talk. <laughs> you know, just so I have something to tell you. Okay, so let's have a look. This is first light, this first thing in the morning. So remember I said the bright spot was gonna be where the sun is. This is where the sun is, that's fine, we're good. But the dark part should be over here. This is what the modelers tell us. The modelers are wrong. It's not. For some reason, first thing in the morning, and the sun and, and sand does look like this. It's odd. The dark spot's in the same plane. That's weird. All of this is facing the sun. I go from light to dark in like 30, 40 degrees. That's whacked. That's not supposed to happen. That's interesting. Then, all I have to do is advance that a few hours. Advance that a few hours and things start to smooth out and look just like what the modelers tell me it looks like. Okay, good. That's, this is two hours later. Not even hour and a half later. And then I go to noon, and it looks like this. This is solar noon. Oh, what a banal surface that is. That's almost perfect. This is, a, this is going to be a great target. And then I go back. This is a little bit later in the afternoon, and that starts to look like the one I just showed you two clicks ago. And then this is last light, and that starts to look like the first one again. Oh, boy. So we have a complexity there that happens for the, it'll be for that December set. Like, how are we going to get that surface to work in December? You're not going to get it to work until I can figure this out. 
And when I figure that out, I'm going to let you know, because it isn't tonight. Uh, and I always said that I was going to end this talk just sort of abruptly, and I won't. I, I have a couple more slides. But I do have a first morning slide. So you've seen what that sand looks like before. That's what it looks like first thing in the morning. This is literally when we first pulled in. This is a second site without so much traffic. We thought we were going to get killed, so we found a different site. And that's how you can go, okay, well, I can see with the ridges in the sand how I can get both the dark part and the light part, maybe, first thing in the morning facing the sun. That could be interesting. The sun looks very different later on in the afternoon. This is the same site just a few hours later. Okay, so if we just move that sun a little bit up, right, then the ripple effect of the sand just sort of disappears. It kind of mutes itself out. And these are the little surface complexities that we're going to have to solve because each and every one of those from this to this is going to be present in our images. And until we can get that sorted out, we're not going to be able to get the kind of correction that we need to get an absolute characterization of the surface. Uh, and then I also should mention that my poor student here, right, when I tell him to wear black, this is great, I tell him to wear black and you have to be fully covered because we don't want to be part of the target. It's 38 degrees, we've got to be out there all day. He's still working with me, right? He didn't even kill me. He's such an agreeable young man. Uh, at any rate, and then I thought, well, at the end, because I'm 40 minutes, and that's what they told me to have, and I'm like, I'm 40 minutes to the... And I just thought I'd say thanks for listening to my crazy talk tonight. And This is like the scene of desolation, right? Where <laughs> students standing there really wishing his life was over, and this would just end. <laughs> it was windy, right? But we're from Lethbridge, so we get the wind, so we know we just throw the ladder on the ground, because it doesn't matter anymore, right? And things are blowing everywhere, and there's our little patch of still virgin sand that we've been measuring all day long. Anyways, I'd like to thank Blackbridge for supporting our talk tonight. Uh, the other partners involved in the research are the folks from Rochester Institute of Technology, South Dakota State University. Those are my friends from the University of Arizona. And then us at the Alberta Terrestrial Imaging Center here at the University of Lethbridge. So that's it. Questions?